recently usap-usapan ang anti-terror bill na ipinasa na uh, o pinirmahan ng parehong Senado at Kongreso. Uh, at alam natin, yung implikasyon nito ay delikado para sa mga karapatan ng bawat mamamay ng Pilipino. Tito, in layman's term, what is anti-terrorism bill and how is it different from the martial law imposed by Marcos? The so-called anti-terrorism bill is actually a bill to carry out state terrorism against the people without any constitutional restraint and with absolutely no respect for the right to due process and for the rights to free speech and assembly. Anyone can be surveilled, framed up, and arrested without judicial warrant and detained without charges for as long as 24 days <clears throat> on mere suspicion of being terrorist or associated with terrorists or a terrorist uh, group of any kind or for speaking or joining any assembly to make a criticism, complaint, protest, and demand against a policy or action of the Duterte regime. The so-called Anti-Terrorism Council exercises the powers and roles of the executive and judiciary. It decides all by itself who is a terrorist that must be subjected to red tagging, vilification, surveillance, arrest or detention. In violation of the Constitution, it issues the orders for the arrest of, of those labeled as terrorists and for their detention far beyond the three-day limit to detain anyone without any charge. The Anti-Terrorism Council plays the role of the Inquisition in medieval times in Europe. The so-called Anti-Terrorism Bill gives those in power the license to abduct and kill people with the unlimited latitude of time and opportunity for them to torture and kill their victims extrajudicially and erase the evidence of their crimes. It removes all liability for illegal arrest and detention. It emboldens the military and police to commit crimes with impunity against those who are tagged as terrorists just because they criticize the regime and make demands on it in the exercise of their freedom of speech and assembly. If Duterte approves the bill or lets it lapse into law after 30 days, he achieves fully his goal of full-blown fascist dictatorship without having to formally declare martial law nationwide. A law of this kind for the purpose of state terrorism practically junks the Bill of Rights in the Constitution and replaces, uh, replaces it with a Bill of State Terrorism. It would make Duterte a far worse a more brazen fascist dictator than Marcos. Marcos did not junk the Bill of Rights outrightly, but went around it by invoking the commander-in-chief provision on martial law and invented the factual grounds for the martial law declaration with the brazenness of Duterte and his servants in Congress in putting forward the sort of unconstitutional and anti-democratic bill, we can expect the worst acts of state terrorism, surpassing those of the Marcos fascist regime and also those of the Duterte regime, which have earned the condemnation of the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights. Tito, now that Duterte said that there is no urgency and that he would review the anti-terror bill before signing it, what should be our next step? The people should remain vigilant and militant. Duterte railroaded the passage of the bill in the Senate and lower house. He can still sign and approve the bill soon or let it lapse into law after 30 days. At the, at the moment, he is play acting that is being deliberate and prudent because of the massive critical response of the legal, constitutional, and human rights experts and the broad masses of the people in the Philippines and abroad who have condemned the brazenly unconstitutional and anti-democratic provisions of the so-called anti-terrorism bill. Duterte is very capable of suddenly declaring a fake revolutionary government <clears throat> to scrap the 1987 constitution in the same manner as Cory Aquino scrapped the 1973 
constitution in 1986. Or he can push through charter change and adjust the new constitution to the provisions of the so-called anti-terrorism bill. After all, he controls the Comelec and the TIM Smartmatic vote count and uh, use a quick referendum to railroad his bizarre kind of constitution. The Filipino people are now confronted with the diabolical and criminal political groups in power and must be ready to wage all forms of resistance to fight the worst kinds of state terrorism. Tito, it is said that anti-terror bill is greatly related or influenced by United States regime. In what way? U.S. imperialism, especially so-called deep state, actually supports Duterte's vow of destroying the revolutionary movement of the Filipino people by any means and his promise of charter change to allow the U.S. and other corporations 100% ownership of enterprises owning land, exploiting the natural resources, operating public utilities, mass media, and all kinds of businesses. Duterte has pleased Trump since their conversation in 2017 by terminating the peace negotiations with the NDFP and continuing, uh, continuing to wage an all-out dirty war of state terrorism against the revolutionary movement. And he has assured Trump that he has been merely humoring China to get infrastructure loans. But in fact, he has emboldened China to build and militarize seven artificial islands in the West Philippine Sea and has allowed China to make major inroads in the telecommunications and energy sectors of the Philippine economy. And certain major U.S. officials are not happy about this, as well as the drug smuggling by the Duterte Drug Syndicate. How will the people struggle, advance, or move forward now that anti-terror bill is in place? And what can you advise to migrant organizations and revolutionary forces abroad? How can we prepare and support the people's movement in the Philippines? While the anti-terrorism bill is not yet scrapped uh, or uh, is still up for signing or uh, another way of enactment, the Filipino people in the motherland and abroad must remain vigilant and militant against it. As I have already explained, Duterte is capable of doing anything to use the, the bill to his own advantage. At the least, while he does, he does not sign it, he can use it for mass intimidation and for pressuring the social activists, his critics, and the opposition. Duterte is a man without any principle and moral scruple. He has been certified as a psychopathic narcissist who is boundlessly obsessed with self-interest and self-satisfaction and who gloats over the humiliation, suffering, and death of other people. He likes to pull surprises. One day he said that he wished to junk the visiting forces agreement, then ultimately he would say he loved it. Is it true that revolutionary forces in the countryside are decreasing? And what will be the effect of the anti-terror bill to the number of revolutionaries and their strength? Can you say that they will be pulverized? Based on the daily fake news circulated by the Duterte regime and military and the commercial mass media about fake surrenders, fake casualties, fake raids, and fake community support projects, and the like against it, the NPA has ceased to exist as early as one or two years ago. So there's no need for the anti-terrorism bill. But the problem for the state terrorists of the Duterte regime is that the NPA enjoys the deep and wide support of the people, keeps on growing in strength because of worsening conditions of oppression and exploitation and carries out tactical offensives nationwide. The NPA is obviously alive and kicking and is growing in strength. That's why Duterte and his armed minions are going crazy, unleashing all kinds of cyber and dirty acts of state terrorism. They find it necessary to push the ATB, which is brazenly unconstitutional and anti-democratic. They are unwittingly exposing their desperation and frustrations, and they seem not to realize that all the repressive laws 
and actions that they unleash serve to outrage the people and goad them to join the armed revolution. The ATV will not decrease the strength of the NPA or pulverize it. Look at how the people concerned with human rights and the entire Filipino people are condemning the bill. This kind of terrorist law merely, or bill at the moment, merely calls attention to the human rights violations that have been committed and will be further committed by the Duterte regime on a wider scale. It arouses the people and inspires the most advanced activists to join the revolutionary underground and the new people's army. As a result, the ranks of the NPA are rapidly expanding. Tito, it is timely how Duterte suspended the termination of the Visiting Forces Agreement while at the same time railroading the passing of the anti-terror bill. A few weeks before, he also bought a new naval ship. Do you think this are all connected and how? Duterte is a big liar. At no time has he been against the Visiting Forces Agreement and other military treaties with the U.S. Duterte and longtime U.S. intelligence uh, Asset, the ND Secretary Lorenzana, have always been pushing their shopping list of military equipment to Washington and the Pentagon. All the time, they've been begging for weapons from the U.S., wasting public funds on, on these, and getting bribes from the private U.S. military suppliers. It is obvious that the U.S. official gun from Trump to the so-called deep state is happy with the anti-terrorism bill and the Duterte's glee in receiving new military deliveries, deliveries from the U.S., including attack helicopters, planes, a naval ship, artillery, and bombs. These are profitable for the U.S. military industrial complex and a huge financial burden for the Filipino people. Tito, what can we expect from Duterte in the upcoming days? Can the Filipino finally oust him or will he last until the end of his term? What do you think? It is possible for Duterte to be ousted anytime before the end of his term in 2022 because the people are undergoing terrible suffering and are eager to rise up and oust him because he has been responsible for aggravating the economic and political crisis of the ruling system and for using the COVID-19 crisis to grab emergency powers, steal colossal amounts of public funds in the hundreds of billions of pesos and to provide uh, and escalate repressive measures. He has failed to provide the medical solution to the COVID-19 epidemic and to deliver the promised food and uh, economic assistance to the people. The ouster of Duterte depends on how the patriotic and progressive forces can generate militant mass actions and build a broad united front with all opposition forces, including the conservative political groups and anti-Duterte groups within the armed forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police and among retired military and police officers. As in the dying years of the Marcos fascist regime, the armed revolutionary movement can also intensify their tactical offensives to gain strength and undermine the Duterte tyranny and persuade Duterte's imperialist backers that he has become more of a liability than an asset to them and to the Philippine ruling system. But let us say that Duterte survives the ouster movement before the end of his term and becomes a full-fledged fascist dictator, a la Marcos through charter chains, or a fake revolutionary government, or he opts for his daughter, Sarah, or Bongo to succeed him because he controls the Comelec and the TIM Smartmatic vote count. The conditions will be even better for the overthrow of no less than the entire ruling system by 2022 and thereafter. By then, the crisis conditions in the Philippines and the world shall have become far worse than now, and the people will become even more desirous of struggling for a revolutionary change of system. If we indeed oust the Duterte dictatorship, what or what will replace him? Won't, be there, won't there be another historical mistake such as the election of Cory Aquino that is in one way or another the same as Marcos? 
And whoever will be the president to replace Duterte before 2022 will depend on the balance of forces among those who can oust the regime. The important thing for the patriotic and progressive forces is to get rid of a terrorist regime and to gain democratic mass strength in the process. Certainly the people's democratic government in the countryside will become stronger and the ruling system will become even weaker. I have learned from relatives, province mates, and friends within the military that they can support the Aus Duterte mass movement if it comes out with mass uprisings as large as those in 1986 against Marcos and are willing to install Vice President Robredo as the constitutional successor to the physically, mentally, and morally deranged president. Should the patriotic and progressive forces reject a priori such a prospect? Is it not better to oust Duterte in the easiest way possible than to allow him to stay on in power? It is wrong for anyone to think it was an error to fight Marcos and thereby pave the way for the presidency of Cory Aquino. The National Democratic Movement and the Armed Revolutionary Movement gained strength by fighting the Marcos fascist dictatorship and causing his ouster and replacement by, uh, by Cory Aquino. The most important thing for the revolutionary forces to do is to keep fighting and uh, gaining strength and taking advantage of the conflict among the reactionaries. <clears throat> it is not an alternative to cease fighting that Duterte regime from, for fear that the revolutionary movement will only pave the way for the ascendance of another reactionary leader for the revolutionary movement to topple the entire ruling system depends on its own strength and the balance of forces. The full range of the United Front policy is to strengthen the basic alliance of workers and peasants, win over the middle social strata, and take advantage of the splits among the reactionaries in order to isolate and destroy the power of one enemy after another. Tito, we are observing that in Europe, the second generation Filipinos are very vocal against the anti-terror bill. In fact, they are actively campaigning against it and even conducting discussions. What can you say about this and how do we in Anakbayan Europa maximize the opportunity to build chapters in various European countries and what can be our important role in this time? I welcome and appreciate the fact that in Europe, second generation Filipinos are very vocal against the anti-terror bill. In fact, they are actively campaigning against it and even conducting discussions. Indeed, the Duterte tyranny has become so notorious because of its crimes of treason, brutality, corruption, and dishonesty. It is now even more notorious than ever before because of the recent release of the report of the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights condemning the Duterte regime for grave human rights violations. In view of the growing notoriety of the Duterte regime <coughs> and the desire of the Filipino youth and people abroad to help the Filipino people struggle for national freedom and democracy, Alakbayan Europa should intensify its efforts to build chapters in various European countries. With the use of the internet and a video conference, you can form chapters even at the level of cities, consequent to the formation of country chapters. Your most important role is to arouse, organize, and mobilize the Filipino youth in Europe. You can also develop solidarity relations with non-Filipino youth organizations and team up with them in exposing and opposing the Duterte regime. Thank you so much, Tito, for having this uh, conversation with us and explaining the anti-terror bill. Is there anything you would like to add? I'm happy to be able to converse with you and our listeners through this forum. I hope that a forum like this can inform and enlighten and uh, even more importantly, inspire us to act resolutely and militantly for the purpose of arousing organizing and mobilizing our compatriots and developing solidarity relations with all foreign friends 
who are interested in a better and brighter world of greater freedom, democracy, social justice, all-round development, <clears throat> and international solidarity of peoples. Uh, thank you. I look forward to being with you in the next web forum. Thank you so much, Tito.